views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. And hello and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today we're going to update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up on today's show, we'll update you on the latest in the world of politics. Afterwards, the Administration for Children's Services opened up a new family center in the Bronx. What does this mean for Bronxites? Well, we'll explain. And after that, we'll show you a project highlighting iconic places in the city, representing the history and contributions of the LGBTQ community. We'll have a little bit more about that a little bit later on in the show. And then, in New York City, obesity is an epidemic. More than half of adult New Yorkers are overweight or obese. This according to data by the New York City Health Department. Today, we've got a special interview to prepare Bronxites to get in the best health and shape of their lives. And then, we want you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way because right now, we're officially open. I'm your host, Darren Jaime, and today is Wednesday, August 15th, and you're watching Open, a live program bringing the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to also encourage you to welcome our viewers that are watching from Manhattan on Manhattan's Neighborhood Network, as Open is now being broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. And also, we encourage you to stay connected to us. How you can do that? Well, you can find out more about us on Twitter at BronxNetTV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. Well, a lot has certainly been going on through the past week. We take you now to some Bronx updates. Well, nearly a year after Hurricane Maria wrecked the island's landscape, Puerto Rico is still a long way from recovery. With that in mind, some Lehman College students ditched a summer vacation at the beach and instead traveled to help and rebuild damaged communities in Puerto Rico. Since mid-June, students from both CUNY and SUNY schools have traveled to the island through not-for-profit donations and also organizations. Now, in fact, up to 500 students are expected to help out in deployment rotations over the next four weeks. Now, once in Puerto Rico, students work alongside skilled professionals performing construction and building tasks while receiving a stipend and college credit for their services. New York has concentrated its Puerto Rican work through the Empire State Relief and Recovery effort, which has distributed more than 4,400 pallets of supplies for more than a dozen donation sites across the state, this according to the program's website. Now, New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo has also pushed for a $94.4 billion federal aid package to Puerto Rico, which suffered billions of dollars from damages from the Category 4 storm last September. And although the students brought hope, tragedy still persists on the island. Well, in an urban area such as the Bronx, farms are few and far between. But thanks to the Riverdale Y Sunday Market, that's all changing. Every Sunday through November the 18th, the Y organizes a farmer's market at Riverdale Kingsbridge Academy, hosting more than 17 local food and craft vendors. Now, the food is locally grown and produced and includes a wide selection of various fares such as quiche, organic breads, kosher cheeses, and of course, a fresh variety of produce. Now, the market started nearly seven years ago when a group of residents decided they wanted to do something a little bit more fresh and a little bit more local. So what did they do? They partnered not only with the Riverdale Y, but Jessica Holler, who serves on the Riverdale Nature Pres uh, Pres uh, Preservancy Board, I should say, and Beth Farms of the Farms Kitchen and Artisan Jam Company. 
And this Sunday, the market that's not unique only brings vendors who sell food, but also vendors who sell crafts. And so you can check them out. Now, over the past few years, the Sunday market has opened many people and has expressed happiness in having a community place to hang out, bring families, as well as meet new people, all while enjoying fresh food as the number of vendors increase every year, along with the selection of farm fresh produce and craft vendors. Now, the Sunday market is growing into a community staple. You're invited to check out the Sunday market. Well, Bronxites will enjoy a great deal of summertime fun. This at the Friends of Community Board 11 Carnival on Sunday, August the 20th at Bronx Park East Trojan Field. The annual carnival being held from Tuesday, August 15th through August the 28th. Well, it features carnival games, mechanical rides, delicious food, and some weekend matinees. Now, for more information, you can contact Community Board 11. That number is 718-892-6262. Once again, that number is 718-892-6262. Get the fun in while the summer is still here. Well, that's all the time we have for Bronx Updates. We'll be back more after this. I guess sometimes things just happen. Devastating things. Your whole world changes in an instant. That's what happened to me the day my mother had a stroke. I'm Paul George, and I want you to spot a stroke fast. F, face drooping. A, arm weakness. S, speech difficulty. T, time to call 911. Protect the ones you love. Spot a stroke fast. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold, the angry giant! Behold, the angry giant! It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. My name is Osvaldo Adames. I grew up in the Bronx and went to school right here at the Bronx School for Law, Government, and Justice. In the seventh grade, I hadn't given college that much thought. But all of that changed when I entered the Bronx Institute at Lehman College's Gear Up program. Gear Up helped simplify the entire college application process, helping me prepare for the SATs and organizing college visits and open houses. Last year, I graduated from Hamilton College in upstate New York with a major in mathematics and a minor in Mandarin Chinese. Now, I'm a teacher at my old middle school. I think back to seventh grade and I honestly had no idea how much help Gear Up would be. They offered me the support I needed to succeed. If you're enrolled in Gear Up, talk to your academic coach or visit the Bronx Institute at www.thebronxinstitute.org for more information. Well, from state to national politics, we now have our political analyst who's gonna be joining us in the studio in just a few seconds. What are we talking about? Well, Governor Andrew Cuomo, he agreed to, uh, I should say, to debate Democratic challenger Cynthia Nixon. What does that actually mean for upcoming primary elections? Well, we'll let you know. And then also, the scandals coming from President Trump's administration to the Manafort trial, Omarosa's recording, and the Cohen investigation. The question is, what does this all mean? Joining us now in our studio, political analyst Lee Bynes. And, uh, I mean... You can't have more stuff to talk about than, I mean, we can keep you the, here the, the whole third. The, the plate is full. The it plate is. is full. Let's go right at it. First of all, let's talk on the local side. Okay. Uh, Governor Cuomo now agreeing to debate Cynthia Nixon. He said he wasn't going to debate, originally didn't concede to any debates. Is this a sign that uh, the Cuomo campaign is weakening? What should we take from this? Well, you know what? Her numbers aren't necessarily moving up. He's got a ton of dough in his coffers. Uh, she's got very, very little. However, uh, if you look back at what happened to uh, Crowley, uh, against uh, Alexandria uh, Cortez, mm -hmm. uh, he refused to debate, and he took her too lightly, and now he's headed for the wings. So I think uh, Cuomo uh, uh, realized that this person, Cynthia Nixon, uh, has got some chops. She's got a message. Uh, she's got a message that's leaning left, and she's pulling him further to the left. Uh, just uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact, the young man, uh, the brother of the young man who's, who died in, um, in uh, Rikers Island uh, via... Uh, suicide because he had been there for three years and he's been given a trial hadn't been given a trial well uh, his brother is deciding to to uh, to back Cynthia Nixon simply because of the fact that uh, 
Well, Cuomo failed to uh, uh, get bail reform underway as he promised. But she's also uh, going to cause him some problems if he doesn't shape up very, very quickly because I was doing some research and found that, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, poverty is, is at an all-time high in New York State overall, but not only uh, poverty, but uh, New York State actually has the highest um, level of income inequality in the country. Of all 50 states, New York is, is is, is pretty much the worst. Now, he's been here for eight, two terms. That's eight years. But you also have people he hasn't saying, closed listen, the gap. Not to cut you off, but you have some people who say, listen, you've got New York, right? And you've got him. New York City uh, has, of course, the biggest. You've got millions of people here. There's a big in, in income equality gap. How much do you attribute that as a realistic statistic, given the fact that you've got so many people living across the five boroughs, which a lot of these numbers, statistics-wise, they're saying is where this comes from. Well, that, that definitely does have a, a substantial impact, but we're also talking about upstate New York. He is the he is the governor for the entire state of New York. And when you go up to, into places, well, where you hail from, in Syracuse, in Buffalo, uh, upstate New York, where I have a little property in, in Dutchess County, those people, I was up there a couple of weeks ago, and I, I was looking around, and it doesn't look as nice as it did 10 years ago. There's a lot of people suffering. If you go down to Poughkeepsie and you're looking at uh, the opiate problem there, you can see that with your eyes visually. So there's a lot of people who have lost their homes, struggling to keep their homes, struggling with uh, two jobs to make earn enough money to to, to keep their family um, uh, uh, fed. Uh, I was also looking, at, again, at the income and quality uh, situation here, specifically in New York City. And it, in order to, to live, to have a living wage, it takes $27 an hour for a family, uh, a, 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 a family of two. Mm -hmm. You need a minimum. Most people in New York, a, a vast majority of them are making far less than uh, $27 an hour. It is a dream. So uh, I'm interested in this. Uh, in this uh, uh, debate that's coming up because I'd like to see how um, Cynthia uh, Nixon mm -hmm. handles herself in that confrontation and it's going to be one. Talking about New York State, let's push a little bit further and go down, uh, go down and take a shuttle down to D.C. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, uh, President Trump in upstate New York this week uh, stumping in Fort Drum as well as up in Utica uh, for Congresswoman Claudia Tinney. Mm -hmm. now, a lot of people are saying that uh, given the fact that he's got this latest, you got the trial that's going on, and now you have the Omarosa tapes, and mm -hmm. some people are now dubbing these the tapes of wrath. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at this situation, how much do you think this is going to have an impact come midterm election? I, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be huge because uh, Nancy Pelosi, whom I'm no big fan of, uh, pretty much uh, labeled his uh, administration a culture of corruption. So I took a look over the last uh, few months to see what was happening. What was happening? As a matter of fact, when we were on the, on this this very set last week, as we were having our conversation, uh, the person who actually announced uh, um, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, to the Republican Party was um, Chris Collins. At that very time, he was being arrested on uh, charges of insider trading. And if I, when I started looking at the list, as of this day, today, Paul Manafort's trial is going into, uh, they're going to be uh, uh, wrapping up. His defense was so weak, they didn't even um, put up any witnesses. They just went straight to closing arguments. There's a good chance that he's going to be facing a conviction, if not here, in the next trial that follows up in a couple of weeks. We got Rick Gates, we got Michael Cohen, we got Michael Flynn, we got Scott Pruitt, we got uh, Bob Porter. These are lesser names, but these guys were uh, uh, went down because of uh, domestic abuse. We got David Sorensen, another one. He was a White House speechwriter, went down because of domestic abuse. And then we got uh, 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 Wilbur Ross, which I'm going to save for when I return because that's premium content, but he's looking at uh, uh, ethics investigations as well. So when we get to Omarosa and you add up all of these, these, these issues together, it does say that there's a culture of co corruption going on. And those tapes, uh, even though that she's not one that can normally be trusted, because I took a random sampling of a lot of people last night to see who was uh, supporting her, very few people had anything positive to say, but she did keep the receipts. And having those tapes to be able to, to because again, she, by her, her account, everybody in that administration yeah, but, but is But the question is, is how, how much do you give credence to this? I mean, you understand that she worked in the White House. Mm -hmm. If she wasn't fired, she'd still be working there. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you say, hey, would you be as vocal? Would you be saying what you're saying? Would you have been complicit for years? And in the hearts and minds of many Americans, it just looks like a fraud. And it's like, bye, girl. You know what? 
up until a point, but she's got the tape. And as long as she has something out there to dangle in front of uh, uh, the administration, they're going to be very, very uh, cool in terms of how they approach her. Now, they are coming after her legally with the, with the, um, uh, some, some charges because she broke what they're saying, that she signed a uh, uh, non-disclosure agreement. But uh, that's not necessarily enforceable in the real world. And uh, she's also indicating that not only has she already been spoken to by the Mueller investigators, but she's willing to, to, to come back. Now, if she's, if she's, that, if she's that confident that she, those extra tapes that she's threatening th to have will make some uh, interesting listening to by uh, the Mueller investigation. They're being called the Tapes of Wrath. We'll continue to follow that, Lee. That's all the time we have. Of course, next week you come on back and bring us some more. That's the plan. All right, Lee Bynes, our political analyst here on open listen stay with us we got more show coming up we'll be right back right after this chiru has no choice she and millions like her walk miles a day for dirty water but together we can end their walk by providing clean water close by instead of spending hours walking to get water that makes them sick girls can be in a classroom and moms will gain back time to care for their families. Sons and daughters can grow up strong, finally free of sicknesses. It's true. When you just add water, you change a life. Learn more at worldvision.org. How can I help my daughter with her reading? Searching for help with Dachshund Reading. No. <laughs> Let me try. Sarah's bright, but when she's reading, she has trouble sounding out words. Playing world music. What? I give up. Wait, I was trying to show you how Sarah feels every day. Frustrating, isn't it? Redirecting to understood.org. Join parents and experts at understood.org, a free online resource about learning and attention issues to help your child thrive. And welcome back to Open. Well, our Bronx that host Javier Gomez, he had a special interview with ACS Subcommissioner Laura Lee Vargas about a new family recess, or I should say family resource center, that's coming up right here in the Bronx. And so we want to take you to his interview right now. Joining us today is Lorelai Vargas, Deputy Commissioner at the New York City Administration for Children's Services. Welcome, Lorelai. I know you recently cut the ribbon of a new family enrichment center in the Bronx. Yes. Tell us about it. It's called Circle of Dreams, and the community has come up with that name. It is a co-designed space. So we are essentially taking the traditional sense of how nonprofits and how government works in terms of providing services in communities and turning it on its head. We're going into the community and saying, you tell us what you need and then we'll provide it. And um, so this is a new initiative. Um, Circle of Dreams and Highbridge, which where we just cut the ribbon, is one of three family enrichment centers. We have another one in Hunts Point, and then we have another one in East New York, and we're really excited about it. This is a huge shift yes. in approaches to, to family support uh, resources. Where does it come from? Has it, has it been tested elsewhere? Yeah, so um, there's a community in New, in New Jersey that's been doing so, this right work. Right next door? Yes, right next door. And uh, there was a group from ACS who went down and kind of met with them and, and took, a, took a look at what they were doing down there and felt like this is probably right for New York City. And, you know, New York City, if you can build it here, you can build it anywhere, right? So, um, so the goal is really to see how these things work, see if they're effective, and, and if they are, we'd like to really scale them up across the city. What can families do in, in, in this center? Yeah. So each center is, again, co-designed with the community. But when you walk into each of them, you feel like you are home. And so it's everything from the centers just create a space, a clean, comfortable space where people from the community can walk in right off the street and have a seat, have a conversation with their friend, um, if you're walking around with your toddler, there's toddler spaces in some, of, in some of the FECs. You can walk in, you can spend some time, but what we really, really want people to do is get engaged. And so one way that they can get engaged is by participating in what we call parent cafes. And parent cafes are an opportunity for parents to come together and have a conversation together about what it is that they need. What do they need to support their families? What do they need to thrive? And so, you know, really the participation of families in that process, helping to inform what services they need, 
that's the biggest, you know, that's one of the best contributions that residents can make. So these are centers where people go not only in time of need, but they also go there for sharing. Yes, and, and what we hope is that, you know, I think the time of need, people coming during times of crisis and need, that's one piece, but most of the people are just coming in because they're walking by and they're saying, hey, this is new, what's going on here? And again, it's a space where everybody is welcome. How are these centers governed? So um, we fund a director in each center and they have a family coordinator and a community coordinator. Um, and, but I think the most important thing is that the staff are from the community. And so they know the community, they know the people in the community, they've grown up there um, in some cases and they know the issues and they're able to engage other people in the neighborhood to come and be a part of this. The Hunts Point Center was the first of its kind in the entire city. Yes. Uh, how is that working out? What's happening there? It's, it's actually great. I encourage everybody to stop by. Um, it's, it's really phenomenal. Um, one, when you walk in, it really does feel like you're stepping into um, a home. It feels warm and comfortable. It's inviting. Um, but some of the services that they've started to put in place there, um, just to give you some examples, you know, Hunts Point never had a Girl Scouts program before. Now they have a Girl Scouts program, and they're convening there at the FEC. Um, there was a woman who came in who said she always, you know, she's, um, she's an, an entrepreneur, she's a chef, um, she has a catering business, and she always wanted to teach young children how to cook. There's an open kitchen space there, and now she's hosting classes on Saturday morning. So really kind of unique supports and services um, for families to thrive. So no center programming is alike. That's correct. They're all very, very different. Um, in Highbridge, we have a program that's been put together to help um, female entrepreneurs support each other, and that program is held in French. Um, and then there's also a, a, an interesting partnership with Hostos, um, where we're looking at um, gang prevention. There, I know there's another center in East New York, Brooklyn. Um, what are some of the programs that communities have requested or established there? Yep, so the East New York program is just getting started. Um, so I think it's very early days uh, for, for that program around, you know, specifically, you know, thinking about what specific programs they're going to they're gonna have there. But we're looking forward to, to what they come up with. How is local community uh, in the High Bridge section embracing the new center? It's been really overwhelming. Um, every time I go out to the different centers, and Highbridge is no exception, the community comes out, they love it. They're grateful for having a space where they can come together, where they can discuss issues that are affecting them as a community, or where, where they can just come and not be disturbed as a community. Um, that's really important these days. We don't have spaces like that anymore. You can, you could sit at a Starbucks maybe or a coffee shop, right. but you've got to buy a cup of coffee. You don't have to buy anything here. You don't have to engage in anything here. You can just come and be a part of, you know, the space. Um, I just want to add that at the ribbon cutting, you know, if you look out at the people who were at the ribbon cutting, you saw dads with their, with, with their babies, you saw grandmas taking care of their grandchildren, you saw abuelitas, you know, there, you saw, you know, community activists who have been advocating for more resources in the community there. So really just this, you know, continuum of people in the community that make up the diverse communities that we're in. Are there any immediate plans for expanding the number of centers citywide? What's next for the initiative? So we're just getting started and we want to be able to evaluate and assess that it's effective and it's working. And once we assess that, then we'll be talking about plans to scale it up. But that's definitely the hope um, that we'll be able to scale these up. What would be the long-term goal for the program? I mean, my goal or, you know, the goal, you know, there's, <laughs> there's always the money component, right? right. Um, so I think the long-term goal of the program is just making sure that we, we have them in communities that don't have these spaces. Uh, Deputy Commissioner, uh, we recently did a Spanish language show, uh, actually a couple of months ago, about uh, foster home resources and adoption resources for families. Can you uh, walk us through briefly about some of the main resources that ACS provides for Bronx families? Yes, absolutely. So I think I think probably just with the time that we have, the most important thing uh, that I would want to share with your viewers is that if somebody's watching this show um, and they have space in their home and space in their heart to open their home up to a foster child, I really want to encourage them to do that. Um, we have 
so many incredible kids who are looking for foster homes um, here in New York City. And all they have to do to get the process started is call 311. That's it, one phone call, and we can get you started. Lorelai, for how long you've been with ACS as Deputy Commissioner? I've been with ACS for almost four years now. When you came in, what were your expectations? What, what was your vision, your plans? So I came in to run the Office of Early Care and Education, and I'm really thrilled at the reforms that we've been able to put in place there. Um, we've introduced some innovative models. Uh, we introduced a trauma-informed care model that we've shared and spread throughout the system, the center-based system. We've worked to increase quality in the early care and education system and to increase access. Really, really proud of that work. Um, also excited now to be leading this new division of child and family well-being. And so, you know, this is the first time that ACS is looking at primary prevention. So thinking about how do we swim really far upstream to prevent families from ever really coming into the child welfare system. So really excited about that work and, and you know, thrilled to be kind of leading this effort. It seems that getting informed is essential. The amount of support for families from, from child care, to, so people can actually get out and work uh, to other areas is really impressive. Yes, and I think one of the main goals of this new division is to connect the dots for families. There are so many resources, so many services um, available across the city, um, but oftentimes our families don't know that they exist. Even providers don't know that the, that the resources exist. So part of the work of the new division is how do you use things like the family enrichment centers or other kind of place-based approaches that we have to begin to bring all of those stakeholders together to introduce them so they know that they exist providing all the services that they're providing but also push that information out to the communities um, so that the residents know that those services exist. That's really important and that's what we're trying to achieve. What can people do to stay in the know? Stay in the know, I think visit our website so that you know, you know what we're doing, what we're up to. There's a lot of innovative work that's happening, um, not only within ACS, but across the city as a whole. So I encourage them to take a look at the sites. Thank you, Lorelai, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Lorelai. Back to you, Darren. All right, thank you, Javier, and guess what? We'll have more on Open right after this. For all the papas out there, let's stop what we're doing and take a moment. A moment to be with our kids. They can be loud moments, goofy moments, sporty moments, dorky moments, kooky moments. Moments where we talk or walk or just hang out. It doesn't really matter. They all count because every time dads take a moment to be with their kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's all take a moment to make a moment today. Smurf. Well, welcome back today. We will show you about a show and show you a project that's highlighting iconic places in the city representing the history and contributions of the LGBTQ community. Now here to tell us a little bit more is Amanda Davis, project manager of the NYC LGBT Historic Sites. And Amanda, good to have you. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about your initiative here. So we were founded in 2015. Uh, we're a group of historic preservationists, uh, a small group, and we're looking to um, document sites around the city associated with the LGBTQ community um, and all five boroughs. And we have an interactive map where anyone can click on those sites and learn about the LGBTQ history of the site. So when, how did you come about this? So the founders of the project, they, in the early 1990s, uh, started documenting these kinds of sites in Manhattan and focusing on Greenwich Village, Midtown, and Harlem, and over the years had continued this uh, research. And in 2014, the National Park Service came out with an underrepresented communities grants program, uh, and we got initial funding for that project to, uh, to start this project. So we're seeing some pictures here. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here in the video. So this is the home, the childhood home of Christine Jorgensen. She was uh, a transgender woman 
um, and really the first famous transgender person in the world. There were other trans people before her, but she received a lot of media attention um, in the early 1950s. She went overseas for a gender reassignment surgery, and when she came back, there was a sensationalized New York Daily News uh, cover page about the gender reassignment surgery, and reporters came to this house, her childhood house in the Bronx, uh, and hounded it for a, a while, and um, she's in Denmark, uh, where she had her surgery, she's recuperating, um, and she really uh, put the term transsexual, as it was used at the time, on the map uh, and introduced uh, the greater American public to uh, the trans community. Yeah, I don't think a lot of Bronx guys do that. It's fresh information to me, too. Yeah. Uh, so let's talk about some of the other sites you have. Sure. So uh, Woodlawn Cemetery is uh, a great, beautiful place, um, and it's a way to remember LGBTQ people. Uh, we flagged, you can see there's a rainbow flag in uh, Pri for Pride Month. We placed pride flags at different um, uh, tombstones of LGBTQ notables. This is Elizabeth Marbury. She was uh, a pioneering female literary, literary agent in the 1890s. She lived with her partner in uh, Manhattan, and she was an agent for Oscar Wilde and many other people. Mm -hmm. And it's also the time when things weren't really as open and as public. Exactly, and she, uh, and here's a leading suffragists um, who are buried together and uh, at their request, and uh, they have a shared tombstone, uh, united in friendship, friendship being a kind of a coded word. Um, yeah, they were very early on uh, living openly um, and, and you know, having a, a social existence, which is important to document. And here we see? Yeah, and these, uh, these are both uh, living artists, uh, Mary Cronin, um, this is a sculpture of uh, two women, uh, the, the two of them, um, lying there and it's this openly open portrayal of same-sex love um, which is really beautiful in, in Woodlawn. Uh, here we have Orchard Beach. Um, it was a, it's been a particularly important social gathering place for uh, people of color, LGBT people of color. Um, and we have re-speech in Queens, and we have much more information about it, where people were back in the 50s gathering on mm -hmm. the northern part of the beach. We would love to hear from Bronxites who may know of you know, how early people were gathering here, where they were gathering, um, always building on more information. And this old time building right here. Yeah, it's a beautiful building. This is where uh, Mabel Hampton and her partner Lillian Foster lived. They were African-American uh, and openly uh, lesbian. Um, from the 1920s onward, they were living in this apartment in the 1940s through the 1980s. Uh, Mabel Hampton lived there a bit longer after Foster's death. Uh, Hampton, in particular, was uh, was uh, played an important role in the LGBTQ rights movement. She was a dancer during the Har Harlem Renaissance, and she was a key member of the Lesbian Her Story archives. And here is Foster and Hampton together, mm -hmm. living openly. Hampton was very proud and spoke about how she lived openly as a lesbian all her life. So a lot of accomplishments, a lot yeah. of things that people can find out. So where do they go where they, where they want more of this information? So we have a website, nyclgbtsites.org. There's, the, there's the interactive map. We're also on uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at nyclgbtsites where we update and share information every day. And tell us a little bit about the response you've been getting. I mean, obviously, you know, putting this information out there, a lot of people say this is history. We're trying to find out for the very first time. and. There's a lot of great stories here. We've gotten incredible uh, feedback from people, an incredible response. Uh, young people in particular, we gave a tour to teenagers in Harlem, and there was uh, a teenager who said, you know, I thought I was alone until I, until I learned about this history. And it was really moving. And, and you hear that from people of all ages, to have this history recognized and out there and celebrated, um, it's, it's really important. So for people who want to check it out, of course, they've got, you got the website where you can check it out. Mm -hmm. What's, what do you have coming up in the, uh, in, in the near future? Well, next year is the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. So we're planning programming throughout 2019. Um, and we have an events page where we'll be updating and adding so people can follow along there. But uh, I hope people will tune in um, for 2019 and, and in the months ahead. Well, Amanda, thank you so much for coming to share with us. As we said, very valuable information. And, you know, right here in the borough of the Bronx, a lot of great things happen. Yeah, we'd love to get more ideas All for right. sites in the Bronx. Amanda Davis, thank mm -hmm. you much. All right, taking a quick break. We've got more shows, so please don't go anywhere. We're going to get you fit right after this.
Open up your books to page 360. Did you just look at your phone while you was in class? You played yourself. Talking about inspirational quotes. You gotta believe in yourself. Don't ever play yourself. The key is to make it, so make it. Louise, Louise, can you give me an example of an inspirational quote? Don't play yourself. The key is to make it. And who said that? I did. Now that's a major key alert. Learn the real major keys to getting to college at GetSchool.com. Back here on Open, we want to thank you for staying with us. Well, I want you to know exercise is fundamental for a better health. Now, joining us is a fitness trainer, my friend, my brother, Derek Batiste, the founder of The Fitness Professional, and Butch Nevis, owner of Mr. America's Training Camp. And guess what? They are partnering together to get us fit and get us some information. Good to have you both. Darren, it's good to see you, buddy. It's been a long time. Long a long time. time. For those of you who don't know, he used to work here with us. And like I said, you haven't aged a bit. Still the Look same. Look at you, man. Time just stands still for you. Hey, listen. Well, you do, know, do you want him back? Hey, well, no, no, no. <laughs> you want him he's back? He's got some great work to do. We, we, he can come back if he wants to, but he's got to, he, don't quit your day job. I'll give you, you know? a part time. I'll give That's you a part -time. it. That's it. Talk to us a little bit about what's going on. So really talking about keeping people fit and letting people know oh, a little man. bit about what's available out there. Well, really, I mean, it's it's um, like you you mentioned earlier when you opened the show. The the obesity is just, I mean, through the roof mm -hmm. these days, and and it's ironic because there's so many gyms now. Like when when he first started uh, back in the late '80s, early '90s, there was just a few gyms, mm -hmm. and maybe two in the Bronx, yeah, right? Today, today you have a lot of options that are open to you, and a lot of information out there. And I mean, that in itself is a little bit of a problem because you get inundated with all this information, and you wind up not doing anything. Right. You know, so we have our facility is pretty simple. We have we offer three simple things. We have a small group training, large group training, and then one to one training. Mm -hmm. So we, everything's kind of suited just to, to get your goals, get your needs, whatever you need to do to get you in great shape. So if a person walks in and says, "Listen, I just know I need to be in better shape. What do I do?" You can walk me through what happens. Well, it all depends on your goals. Some people want to just lose weight. Some people, believe it or not actually want to gain some weight. Mm -hmm. I know that's hard to believe, but that does happen. It does happen. happen. Yeah, time. Really. Some people want to improve their athletic performance. So it really depends on what their goals are and stuff. And that's how we kind of dictate which way they go. Like the boot camps are the most common. That's where most people want to lose weight. And we mm -hmm. have a, a weight loss challenge coming right up where the, uh, the winner who loses the highest percentage of body of body fat will win $1,000, which is a really nice little little thing to do. You Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. And, uh, we do that for a three-month period, and uh, we weigh everybody every week, and there's a lot of accountability. It works really well. A big group gets together, and it's really motivating. Derek, what do you tell people? I mean, there's not a lot of people who say, I want to do this. But, you know, sometimes it's just hard to come through the door. You know, they watch us on TV right now and say, yeah, I want to do this, but... How do you, what do you tell people about that? Well, really, it, it's just just really walking through that door. I think that's the toughest part. It's just just saying, you know what, let me let me go in, let me talk to these people and see what they can do for me. Mm -hmm. And and we welcome that. We have so many people that, that come in who are not in shape at all. Right. You know, and they just they they say, Oh, we've I've tried this gym, I've tried that gym, I've tried this diet, I've tried that diet, and they've gone nowhere. So what we do, I mean, we, we have a, a gentle touch, but we also use tough love, mm -hmm. and, you, and they feel that. And we're very compassionate every day. And it's not just in the gym. It's on the phone. You could text us anytime, any questions, right. any, anything. I mean, There's it, some it's accountability. There's accountability. And then if we don't see them for a few days, we call them and say, well, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. that's, so That's pretty cool. It's, it's, um, it's something that, that we're very proud of. We really enjoy the, the, the people that come and then they really become a part of our uh, of our fit family. And you got a great fit family and we know you've had your show here on Bronx that is Yeah, well. back in the day, but equal fitness. fitness and, and have that for people who want to come, check you guys out, find out more about what's going on, tell us. Well basically you could look at the website Mr. America's Personal Training dot com. Mm -hmm. uh, we're located on thirty two twenty nine East Stream on the Bronx, New York. And you can call us at seven one eight eight two four seven four four seven. You get the last word. 
Well, listen, just if you're thinking about it, if you're having any problems, if, you, if you're just fighting, having that inner, inner battle within yourself, please come see us. We can help you and we can make Hit it happen. Hit us up on social media as well, Butcher Nevis or Derek Batista, and we could help you with any questions. Okay. I have to come see you after work. How about that? You better, D. I know, I know, right? <laughs> Good to see you both. Good to see you. All righty, listen, taking a quick break. Watch it. Stay with us. Get their information. Get fit. It's better to have a healthier lifestyle. Don't wait till it's too late, all right? Taking a quick break. Be back with more show right after this. I'm only 17, but I know about investing. Believe in something. Buy shares in it. Watch it grow. So what if you could invest in the future? The future of kids, like a stock. Not the kind of stock that's about making money, but a stock for social change. A whole new kind of investment called Better Futures. When you invest, it helps kids go to college. I could be one of the first college graduates from my family. The first philanthropist from my neighborhood. And if I'm the first, then maybe there's a second and a third. Believe in us, invest in us, watch us grow. My name is Sydney, and I'm your dividend. And welcome back. There is a free seminar scheduled on weight loss surgery at St. Barnabas. Now, here to inform Bronxites on some different surgery procedures and aftercare is Dr. Nassim Hamayas? Uh, Namias. Namias, okay, there you go. Medical Director of the Center for Bariatric Surgery at St. Barnabas. And uh, thank you, Doctor, for coming to share with us here. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. No problem. So talk to us. Uh, why did you guys decide to open up a Center for Bariatric Surgery? So You know, obesity in the Bronx, as you just previously about, right? just talked about, it's, it's tremendous. Uh, it's a big social problem, it's a, it's a everything problem. So with 30% of our population uh, overweight or obese, you know, uh, we, everybody knows somebody. And uh, given that it affects some of our, uh, you know, most uh, impoverished populations, this is, this is a great place to transform the population. We talk about the Bronx, we talk about being number 62 out of 62, you know, uh, counties that when it comes to health, we rank the worst. We know that there's this not number 62 campaign, but how bad is the obesity problem here in our borough? Well, it, it is it is the, the worst in the state, without a question. And uh, a lot of it is multifactorial. You know, we cannot point, pinpoint this is a problem because of your heritage or your genes or your lifestyle. It is a combination of all those things. So when you have somebody that's obese, right, you have a lot of people considering weight loss surgery. So talk about who are the prime people who really should be considering weight loss surgery? Well, I, I tell you, this uh, weight loss surgery uh, is not for everybody. Um, you know, most of my patients think about the, uh, in, coming to a seminar for two or three years mm -hmm. prior to, to coming. But uh, it's uh, for someone that is overweight for more than 100 pounds, and has been trying and being unsuccessful uh, with diets, with exercise, uh, and many times misguided. You know, mm -hmm. we, we try to do the best we can over and over and over until we break down. Right. And uh, it, ca it comes to, coming to a professional is a very good first step. Right. Uh, in, uh, in when it comes to weight loss uh, diets and fat diets, you know, everybody try them and they, Work out for about a month and then we then stop. Right. Then we let, we know that surgery sometimes is the final option. So there are ways that possibly people could avoid surgery and really enter into weight no, weight loss. I should say. Uh, you got some seminars. Let's let's walk people through. What do you get at a seminar when you show up? So when you come to the seminar, we will talk about who we are, why get why have it done at St. Barnabas. It's a very exciting thing for a community. St. Barnabas is a very community friendly, very. Uh, open and friendly environment for patients to come and, and have any procedure done. I chose to come to St. Barnabas uh, because I think it's a, great, it's a great institution. And it's right here in the Bronx and we're gonna be doing a lot of good things for the people down in the Bronx. Uh, in the seminar, we will talk about the operations. We will talk about who's a candidate and who's not and what is the process on how to get the, the surgery done in the Bronx. Alternatives. 
Because there are alternatives to surgery. Course. So, so somebody's out there watching and saying, "Listen, I, I don't want to do surgery. What are my alternatives?" So let's let's uh, uh, let's pinpoint that. Mm -hmm. If you want to lose twenty to thirty pounds, there are medications. There are programs with uh, diet and exercise that that do work, and a little weight loss can go a long way when it comes to medical problems. However, when we are over a hundred pounds overweight. That is not the case. Study after study has shown that, you know, drastic interventions like surgery go, go farther and better down the line. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if we talk about uh, our program, our program includes a dietitian, M myself, we have a multidisciplinary team. So it's not just like you see one person that, that is gonna see you as a whole. We're gonna see you as, as a whole person. Uh, we, you're going to have uh, a psych person talk to you because a lot of our patients, you know, even they, they don't even know they're a little depressed. Some of our patients have sleep apnea or other medical conditions that prevent them from, from being their best as well. You, you hit it. I want to push a little bit further on it. Talk about the dietary program. When you, when you talk about the dietary program, uh, a very important step, give us a little bit more about what a person will get in a dietary program with you because that, that that's major because a lot of this could without having to do surgery sometimes diet can be your ultimate key and you know we we as i told you this is not for everybody but for uh, uh those patients that want to come in and start the program they are welcome mm -hmm. they are welcome to come in and uh, meet our team get uh, a full work uh, checkup see your dietitian or dietitian works with them uh, six months prior to a surgical intervention. And if they are not interested in surgery, we work with them also uh, regarding uh, weight management and weight loss. Now remember, there are a lot of things out there in the internet, Chinese remedies, things written in languages we don't even understand, and we try it casually. Right. Think those things are very, very dangerous. And I, I really wanna stress to your, to your audience, you know, don't try things like that. Don't think it's gonna be casual. It's a bad, bad idea. Go to a professional and start there. Some people have like hypothyroidism and they just need thyroid hormone to feel to get back in track. Right. Some people have other issues why they gain weight. It's not just like poor behavior and, and treating ourselves uh, and being mean to ourselves, you know. It's time to bring some kindness into this too. Well, we want to tell our viewers, thank you for coming and sharing with us too today. We want to tell our viewers as we close out, listen, on Tuesday, August the 21st, uh, from 5.30 to 6.30, uh, the doctor and his team are going to host a free interactive seminar on weight loss surgery, and that's going to be at St. Barnabas Hospital. Uh, that's going to be over at the Breaker Ballroom, Boardroom, I should say, uh, 3rd Avenue and 182nd Street in the Bronx. Once again, August 21st, 5.30 to 6.30, uh, a team will host a free interactive seminar on weight loss surgery at St. Barnabas. Make sure that you take advantage of that. Get the necessary information. Come to a seminar and see what you need. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, thank you very much. And, you know, just to say, it's free. If you want to come and check out the program, we're very, very happy to have you. Good to have you here, too. Thank you. All righty, listen, stay with us. We've got more open. We'll be right back. Well, Ngozi aims to make the art experience financially accessible to everyone and to facilitate artists' abilities. Here now to tell us more about the Art Collective, about Ngozi LLC, is partner Gabriel C Fan Fantuzzi. Fantuzzi. Right? Fantuzzi. TCM, right? Say TCM, yeah. I say TCM. See, I got it all together. That's Gabriel phenomenal. Say TCM <laughs> Fantuzzi. Tell me, you got to talk about Say TCM. Say TCM. That's a nom de plume. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx painting trains. And that was the name that I went by when I painted trains. All right. So. And, and did you enjoy that? Uh, yeah, I did. I actually had a lot of fun. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about it. Give us a little information here. Uh, so Ngozi, I'll tell you about Ngozi. 
it's actually first the word itself Ngozi. People ask me, is it Ngozi? Ngozi, I tend to pronounce it Ngozi, but it's actually technically Ngozi. Mm -hmm. And so Ngozi is a play on words. It's um, Nigerian. Ngozi is in Nigerian is a woman's first name. It means blessing. Mm -hmm. And then Negocio is business. So I took the two. It's a loose play on words and I created Ngozi. So it's an art collective, right? So it's uh, three partners. It's myself, John Crash Matos, who's a notable Bronx artist, and then uh, Robert Cantor, who's mm -hmm. also an entrepreneur and very successful person that it actually is one of the partners in Warworks Gallery in mm -hmm. the Bronx. So we put it together because we, you know, as an artist myself, John is an artist and we're around artists in the artist community and we talk all the time about the issues that artists have in legitimacy, particularly, particularly in what we do, mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of sort of urban art, graffiti sector of things. And so we decided to put together a scalable platform. So we have apps that can be downloaded, downloaded for iPhone and for Android. We also have a website um, and we have a different selling model than most mm -hmm. other art selling sites and it's sort of sl you know, slanted towards the artist right. and the be more beneficial to the artist and it allows them the freedom to come and go as they please. Talk to me about giving art a voice because this is what you're actually doing too, right? In, in, a, in a lot of ways, giving art art a voice, right? Because it's, it's ten we, I don't know, I guess at this point we're kind of last, the last people to the party mm -hmm. as far as, as an art form. Graffiti as an art form, legitimate art form is not that old compared to other art forms, so it's not as globally accepted as the other art forms are. So, you know, being that we have access to some of the best of the best, you know, in, in just in our immediate circle, just because it's fairly new and we all grew up doing it, you know, we, we can lend a voice through what we're doing and the connections that we have to these people. We can actually put them in a format of legitimacy and actually present it to the people in a way that makes it equivalent to the other art forms. Before we get out of here, please tell me how people can get connected to you. What do they do? Um, you, can, you can find me at uh, hashtag SADETCM, S-A-D-E-T-C-M, on Instagram, easy to find. Uh, you can uh, email me at uh, gfantuzzi22 at gmail.com. You could also go to the website, ngozi.com, N-G-O-Z-Y.com, and you can find us through there. You can send us a note through there if you need to find all us. Right. And find out all the latest that's happening. Thank you yeah. so much for coming and sharing with us. And as people continue to download, hopefully they'll be able to get more in tune with what's happening. And thank you for coming and being a part of this. You're welcome. All righty. Can I add one, one last thing? Yeah, real quick. So we have, we, have a, we have a huge event happening August 25th at the Point Campus. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a cultural event. It's a cultural happening. We have DJ Jazzy J spinning all day. And we have 20 of the top artists painting live for the audience. So feel free to get there. It's from 1 to 8 on Saturday, August 25th, rain date the 26th the next day. There you go. Come you on need out to be and there. check it out. Need to be there, right? You need to be there. It's going to be the party. All right. Thanks for coming, Sharon. Thank you. All right, listen, stay with us. We are moving real quick. Got more show. We'll be right back in a few. Leaving hot coals improperly extinguished can cause a wildfire. Hey, guys, it's smoking. It looks as if smoking is going to use the drown, stir, drown, and feel technique. After the first drown, a good start. Next, another drink. Next, and finally, a close feel. Is it cool? cool? Okay. Yeah. Hey, Smokey, catch. Oh, my bad, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. Well, we are back as the summer is about to end. We hate to say the summer's about to end. It's about to end, though. I want you to know there's still enough time for you to enjoy the best of our borough. Now, here's also a bit more about it is artist and community activist, Lovey Pignata, and thank you for coming. Hello, thanks as for I having me. As I said in the intro, the summer is not coming to an end. We're trying to extend it as far as we can, but there's still some things we can do. Yes. So give us a little bit about this here. Oh, uh, there's a few art happenings going on. Um, every Friday, fun, or Fun Fridays at Virginia Park, mm -hmm. and they include an art activity. It's open to the public, 4 to 6 p.m. That's with Loving the Bronx. Um, I had artwork there through a Uniqlo grant last year, but now there's new artwork. There's also some new artwork coming to Concrete Plant Park mm -hmm. through the Bronx River Alliance. Three artists were selected. I'm one of them. Um, that show will be uh, up the end of this month. And that'll be three sculptures within Concrete Plant Park where the foodway is, the new foodway is. So for people who want to check this out, obviously a lot of stuff they can, take, they can really go and check out. Talk about your work and what you do. Okay, my work, um, I, I'm a public artist, which I like to do work that interacts with the, the public. Um, I had an installation in Virginia Park for a year that had canoes and a swatch of the Bronx River to bring people's awareness to the river and just to interact. We use them as stages and as, you know, all, di all different things. We had yoga there, 
uh, drumming. And in Concrete Plant Park, it will be interactive as well. Um, the, my pieces will be installed in the ground. They're, they're made uh, to replicate turtles, which was the symbol of the first, uh, the first human residents of the Bronx River, mm -hmm. which are, were the Mohegan Indians. Interesting. Now, you've got an event coming up. Of course, I want to make sure to tell our viewers about the event. Which event? Well, you got a couple of them coming up. I have a you? few. All right. Well, well the opening, uh, there's no set opening date for the Concrete Plant Park yet because that was a fast track project. We also have events going on at um, Orchard Beach, and that's through the Friends of, mm -hmm. the Friends of Pelham Bay Park. We have uh, Beach Days, Riviera Nights. We've had two rain out. So we're hoping that the last two days really happen. We have a rescheduled um, roller skating from 1 to 5.30 on Saturday, free skate rental or bring your own, mm -hmm. and we'll have music with Uptown Vinyl Supreme, a local uh, DJing service. And after that, there's a silent disco. Next week is the first drive-in movie in the Bronx, and that is Black Panther, and it will be in the Orchard Beach parking lot. We'll have food trucks and entertainment, drumming, Awesome. Well, a lot for our Bronxites to do. Yes. So definitely want to come out. We are hoping that the weather prevails. Yes, it has been raining, literally coming down, but we are hoping really that uh, we get some good weather, we can get these events in. Yes. Thanks so much for coming. Thank Shane. you. Thanks for having me. All righty. Well, we want to tell you, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of our guests for joining us, but most of all, I want to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Now, if you missed any part of today's show, yes, you can catch the Recablecast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum's Channel 67, Verizon Files Channel 33, or watch us anytime on the web at bronxted.org. I want to thank all of our viewers on Manhattan Neighborhood Network who are watching us live simultaneously as Open is broadcast live simultaneously on the MNN channel. Special shout out to my sister, whose birthday is coming up on tomorrow. Just want to say happy birthday, Ann, and uh, we will talk to you soon. Take care. That's about all we've got here for Open. Take care. God bless. The angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. Behold the angry giant. It only takes a moment to make a moment. Take time to be a dad today. If you want to stay in the know about the latest happenings in Espanol, check out Dialogo Abierto, Bronxnet's own Spanish show, Wednesday, 6.30 p.m. on Channel 67. The latest in news, arts, culture, politics, and what's going on in your neighborhood. Dialogo Abierto, the best way to stay connected in Spanish. See you there. Te esperamos.